Hey Books, you welcome back to my channel and welcome to the next in the series called A Closer Book. This is where I talk about three of my recent reads. Today we're talking about books 23, 24, and 28 in my 2019 reading. The reason that there are numbers missing in that sequence is because those books are going to have single book reviews. So today we're just going to talk about these three recent reads. They're not quite so recent. These are books that I read in February. I'm sorry, I'm way behind on filming video reviews. But if you want to help me make this channel a little bit more lucrative, and help me make videos on a more consistent and timely schedule, then you could click one of the links in the description box and support my channel in any way. Anyway, today we're gonna to talk about these three books, which all have a theme in that they show women overcoming adverse circumstances. Two of the books are set in really strong patriarchal societies, and yet we see these women emerging as very strong characters. So the first book we're going to talk about is She Would Be King by Wayuta Moore. And this one I got an arc from Beautifully Bookish Bethany. She shared this arc with me, and I've had this arc for several months, and I finally got to reading it in February. So thank you, Bethany, for introducing me to this book. I read it during Black History Month, and now I'm talking about it during Women's History Month, so that's great. This book is set in three different locations, and we're featuring people of African descent from the African diaspora, and they're gifted and talented beyond their circumstances, and eventually they're able to overcome the circumstances that they're born in, and these three people are able to combine their gifts to help in the establishment of this free black society called Liberia. The first character we meet is Bessa. She's born in a West African village called Lay, and she's born on the day which is unlucky because an old woman has cursed a cat. The cat has returned to haunt the old woman and kill her. And the community has declared a day of mourning or an unlucky day, and that's the day when Bessa is born. So from the time Bessa is born, she's called Bessa the Witch. That's all she's ever called. And she and her family are ostracized and forced out of the community. But Bessa has a gift. She has a gift for life. And so even though she is starved of both physical and emotional comforts, she survives. And develops a kinship or friendship with someone who is a ruler in the community, but she's still excommunicated. And Bessa finds her way to a lot of places and eventually becomes established as a pretty powerful woman. The second character we meet is a young man who's born in supernatural circumstances on a slave plantation in Virginia. He is born to a human slave father and a undead ghost mother both black people and yet he has human form john day is his name and he has a gift where when you try to hurt him he doesn't bear any of the scars so if you shoot bullets at him the bullets fall off they bounce off him like robbers if you try to whip him his skin doesn't break and then we have a third character born in jamaica of a slave mother a maroon slave mother and the white man who comes from Britain to study her and her people. And this young man, he has the gift of disappearing. So he's able to control his thoughts. And when he wills it, when he wishes it, he can just disappear. And eventually these three people find themselves in Africa, some of them accidentally, some of them intentionally. And they're able to put their powers together to create or to help create this new society called Liberia. And there's a lot that this book accomplishes in that we get to see the rise of power overcoming forces that would seek to, to dim it. But we also see these women overcoming the patriarchy. So Bessa, she's, you know, the witch and the maroon slave woman, she's able to use her cunning and her skills to navigate through a system that would seek to enslave her and steal her power from her. Even as they're trying to study it, they wanna manipulate her, but she's able to take it and produce something that is even bigger than herself. And so there's a lot in this book about female power and what female power could accomplish. Even though June Day is born in this Virginia slave plantation and has this slave background upbringing we also see in that part of the narrative how women even though they are enslaved and taken as concubines and raped and plundered we also see them bonding together and see them using their feminine wows and their womanly power 
to do what they can to produce something that is bigger than themselves. So that is really the theme in this book, how women and even the male characters are representative of the women who have brought them. How these people who would be minorities, how they're able to overcome the circumstances that they're born in when they find a way to unite, find a way to work together. I didn't love everything about this book. It did dither in some places, but I really like the title of the book. I like the way the author portrayed this idea that women would be powerful, they would be kings, except that they are female. And while we can acknowledge what these women are able to accomplish, we also see the limits of their power just because of the society and the way the society is. So in the case of Bessa, while she's powerful and everyone knows that she is the power behind these systems, because of the way the world is, she would be king, except that she was born female. And so there's a lot that the author talks about, about the patriarchy suppressing feminine power. And I like the way she approached it. I didn't love everything about the execution. And the fact that we had three very separate locations, three very separate settings, and three very different characters. Some of them were told from third person narratives. And we had this first person narrator who was never quite identified, but seems to be the voice of the wind, except, yeah, the same wind blows everywhere. So we did get a sense of the unison carrying and bonding all these characters regardless of where they started off. I'm not a huge fan of that kind of supernatural, but I enjoyed seeing the way the author used that, used that unity, that uniting power of the wind to put all these characters together. So I really admire what the author presented and what she was able to accomplish in her thematic studies what she was able to show that if we're able to overcome our prejudices and work together, that we can accomplish much, much more than we could as individuals. Because even though we all start with gifts and talents, sometimes it takes joining forces together in order to accomplish something bigger than ourselves or our own individual potential. So I really admire that and I want to recommend the book for that, even though I also must acknowledge that the book was not perfect and there were some gaffes and some misses, but I'm not going to focus on that because there's a lot that I think you can still get from this book even with that. So recommend this one. The next book that I read also talked about feminine power and this is Pearl Box, The Good Earth. I read this one because Britta Bowler over on the channel, I think her channel name on YouTube is Britta Bowler, even though she also calls her channel The Second Shelf, which I really admire because that's also a discussion about women. Britta Bowler on her channel is doing a Noble Women Read Along where every month, I think ever since November, she's been reading and hosting a read along of a book that was written by one of the female Nobel Prize winning authors. And in February, the book that we were reading together was The Good Earth, by Pearl Buck, who's an American writer who spent some time in China and she was able to write about the things that she was seeing in China long before we were getting books translated from China. And so Pearl Buck, I think, won the Nobel Prize just because of what she presented from this world that we didn't really have access to before her writings. She's been criticized for it. I think she was criticized for the fact that she, as a female, wrote this book that is really following a man. But I think she also stayed very true to femininity and feminine power by the way she presents women in this society, a society that considered women as commodities. She also showed the impact that women had in society and women had in their families because while we see these men ascending, rising to power or devolving, we also see what the women do in their lives that pushes them either up or down. So the story itself, we meet this man and it's very interesting because we meet him on the day when he's about to be married and we see him go through his preparations for his bride. Something that we usually see the woman preparing for her groom. But in this case, we have a young man. He lives in the house with his father who's much older. And his father is no longer able to provide for himself and he no longer has to because he has a child. And this is pre-revolutionary China, so very traditional patriarchal society, but also a very ageist society. So after you've had children and they're old enough, 
to provide for themselves and take care of themselves, you no longer have to do anything because your children will take care of you as well. So that's the situation that we meet. Wang Long is his name. And he's taking care of his father who's old and crotchety because he makes demands that some of them seem unreasonable. But on the day when Wang Long is to be married, he's careful to let you know that this is the last time that he'll have to do any of these things because the woman that is coming his wife will now take care will now take care of all the domestic duties she will take over all the things that he's previously had to do so it's the last time i'm doing them is fine and so we know the kind of life that his wife will be coming into and when we meet her we know a lot about her and it's pretty much all the author is trying to say that you need to know about her she is a slave being exchanged from one master to another. Her husband has had to pay for her. So really, he's buying a slave for his house. But Olan, she grew up in the house of Huang. This is the house of the rich man. And she was sold into slavery by her parents because they were hungry and they needed to appease their hunger. And so she was sold to this rich man. So she grew up there, grew up as a kitchen slave because she wasn't pretty enough to be a concubine. And now Wang Long has assured her for himself, she's taken, he's taken over her domestic duties from the house of Wang to his house, Wang Long's house. And there's a striking contrast of rich versus poor, wealth versus poverty the contented life of the rich person versus the ambition of the poor man who is striving for something more in his life. And we see when Wang Long goes to the house of Wang, the rich man's house, when he goes to collect his wife, the person who's representing the superiority in the house is the wife of the Lord of the house of Wang. So old Lord is pursuing his own lustful desires. And so he doesn't really deal in the day-to-day -day management of the household, it's the woman we see the female as the representative of that power. Throughout the book, that hierarchy persists. We see women representing these male desires. And as we go through the cycle of Wang Long and Olan's life, their marriage, the children that they bear, we see their relationship to the land, their connection to the earth, what the land brings, what it requires from you in exchange for what it offers. The narrative is written in a very linear format and it's written almost like a fable. I'm gonna read random chapter beginning. Now Wang Long had more land than a man with an ox can plow and harvest, and more harvest than one man can garner. And so he built another small room to his house and he bought an ass and he said to his neighbor Ching, sell me this little parcel of land that you have and it just goes like that linear we're following these characters and after a while we don't get too many names we get the son the elder son the younger son the slave the fool in this book women are slaves from the time they're born to the time they die they are considered as slaves but even more profound they consider themselves as slaves wang long before Olan is poor and when he buys her from the house of Wang she brings riches into his house but he doesn't acknowledge that she's the one who brings wealth to him in fact she continues to be his commodity and when she no longer is able to provide as rapidly or as consistently or as abundantly as she did before he feels like he desires another and it's a little emotionally devastating to read how women are portrayed and how women see themselves in this society. I'm going to recommend this one highly. This is a five star book for sure, but you know, as a classic, it's very difficult to rate classics. But what this book accomplished, what this book brings, I have no hesitation in recommending this book. If you haven't read it, I recommend that you read it now, that you put it on your TBR for today, for next week, for next month sometime soon read the good earth by pearl buck and let's have a chat about it if you've already read it or when you read it come back to this video and let's talk about it in the comments down below and the last book i'm going to talk about is book number 28 from my 2019 reading which i did as a buddy read with krista from books and jams hi krista she watches my videos i like her we read girl at war by sarah novich this one is about a young girl who's growing up in croatia 
at the time of the civil war between Bosnia and Croatia. This is in the 1990s. And when we meet Anna, she's 10 years old. She's living in Zagreb, which is the city in Croatia. And while there is a little bit of a civil unrest happening around her, she and her friends are, for the most part, engrossed in their childhood activities. And so they don't really notice even how the war and the prejudice is affecting them. So they're living in this town. They have neighbors that are from the opposite side. They have Bosnian neighbors who live in their community and they exert prejudice. They see prejudice being inflicted on these people and they even make it into games. And so for them, they're carefree. Their life is the only one they know. But as novels would happen, there's a transition. So as the civil unrest gets even worse, her sister gets sick and there's no way to get help in their community, in their town. And so they travel across the border to get some medical attention for her sister. Eventually they decide they have to send her sister to America to get the help she needs. And on their way back, they're arrested and Anna gets separated from her parents and the next time we meet her, really, she's living in America herself. She and her sister have been adopted by an American family. And Anna is now a college student, haunted by the war that she escaped because she was a child, but also wanting to go back home to kind of deal with the memories and the losses that she experienced there. And so there's a lot of flashback and flash forward as we see this young woman who grew up during a war but even after she escaped the physical violence, she's still experiencing the turmoil emotionally. And the book presents a lot about the war that I didn't know, I didn't know that I didn't know. So I was glad that I read this book because it brought a little bit of light about a period of violence and unrest that happened during my lifetime and that I was for the most part unaware of. And it's very emotional to read this young girl's account of what happened. And the author, Sarah Novich, grew up during this time. And so I don't know how much of the book is fictional and how much of it is based on her own experiences or on the experience of maybe a family member because the timeline of this book doesn't quite match up with her own personal timeline. But I'm sure a lot of this is based on personal experience, whether hers or someone that she knows. So the idea that these are real stories and based on the real experiences of real people makes it difficult to judge the story itself. But there was a little bit about the transition back and forth where it felt like it felt like it was a little difficult to identify with the main character. I felt like she was being a little unfair, like she was taking out her victimhood and making people pay for things that they had no part in doing to her. But again, I don't want to feel like this is more memoir than novel. And so I didn't want to judge it very harshly because of that. I appreciated a lot about the novel, its presentation of the war in Croatia and Bosnia and the very difficult political situation in the Balkans in general. As the main character, when we met her, is a 10-year-old girl, and it showed the very unique perspective of a child growing up in this time and the effect that it would have on someone even after they've been removed from the situation. So I wanna highlight the accomplishments and not say too much about the things that I didn't like. So these are three of my recent reads. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. And if you've read any of these, I wanna talk a little bit more about them. I'd love to do so in the comments. Come back for more of my videos i'm going to be talking about three more recent reads very soon very soon another video like this one will be coming soon i promise but thanks for being here today and until next time until we come back to talk more books until then happy reading